I know you've been asked this question a bunch, but I do have to ask you because this is your first Oscar nomination. I mean, that morning, were you watching the announcements? Were you expecting this? Did you sort of wake up to a barrage of calls? Like what was? I was not watching the announcement. I wasn't up early. Uh, I was on deadline. Mm. Um, I think I was working on Dune 2 that day. Um, so I had been up till like two in the morning the night before writing and I just crashed out. Mm -hmm. So um, I started being awakened by phone calls at like the start of business. Um, and that's when I realized what it must mean. Um, and then, yeah, there was like a little raft of incoming calls uh, offering congratulations, which was pretty cool. Well, congratulations. That's, that's really, really um, amazing. So I, I kind of want to start at the beginning just because I'm so curious about the screenwriting process because writing is often so like done in isolation. So did yes. you have like meetings as far as the story? Did you just sort of write a script and turn it in? Like, what was that process like for you? When I came aboard, there was some haste. Um, I think the production didn't feel like they were where they needed to be, um, but they were prepping. Like they were pretty darn sure they wanted to make this movie. Mm -hmm. um, and they were getting close to the place where they needed to get that green light. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the process went very quickly. I met with the folks at Legendary. We talked about the project. They were enthusiastic. I jumped on a Zoom call with Denis and we met for the first time. Uh, we liked one another very much and talked through the story. Um, mm -hmm. And he was extremely gracious. And we saw things the same way. We uh, both believed in the importance of the character of Jessica as an almost a co-protagonist of the film mm -hmm. um, and that the female voices needed to be very strong. We believed in a faithful interpretation of the novel. Um, uh, we believed that Frank Herbert was unabashedly uh, a partisan of the Fremen and that, you know, on, on the, in the moral landscape of his universe, he took their part very much. Mm -hmm. um, and we love the complexity with which he looked at the morally complex and compromised world of the imperialists, the Imperium and the royal houses ruling all these planets. Uh, what's fascinating about that is that even the good guys, the Atreides, who are just and honorable monarchs and beloved rulers, are aware of the inherent injustices of the society that they've been born into. And they're aware that they've been born on top. Um, and it's fascinating to me to see a story about those kind of royal houses play out um, in a self-aware way. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Dini and I high-fived over the Zoom call on agreeing <laughs> on uh, an approach to the story and I jumped in. Uh, the script I'd been shown at that point was an edit by Denis of prior work by Eric Roth. And Eric Roth had written these sprawling 200 page epic scripts. Um, and then Denis had whittled one down to 120 pages. Um, and it was full of good stuff, but it wasn't flowing yet. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the book and I did a fresh start and it was moving very quickly. I had about six weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but happily, because I had read and reread the book throughout my youth, I knew it exceedingly well. And so I didn't have to go through a phase of familiarizing myself, which with a 700 page novel of that density would take real time. Right. Um, and I was able to jump right in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I marked up and dog-eared and demolished a copy of Dune and then did a fresh adaptation straight from the book. Um, and had sort of my clean screenplay take on the first half of the novel. Mm -hmm. And then I sat down with the Villeneuve Roth draft and side by side of them and looked at the ways in which they'd taken slightly different approaches. And in particular, every place where I could see Denis filmmaking on the page in his draft, like clear moments of visual invention and moments where it was just very plain he had a vision for this moment everything got imported and moved over and sort of smooshed the two drafts together uh, to create an omnibus mm -hmm. and that made everybody very happy and the movie got greenlit and then we were stampeding forward but of course Denise still had many thoughts and so we went into an iterative uh, collaborative process where I would go wherever he was working hammer and tongs on pre-production Mm -hmm. And I'd get a hotel suite down the road <laughs> and 
he would roll in every morning at nine o'clock and we would talk about the script until we would break for lunch and keep talking about the script until two or three in the afternoon, just straight through all work. And then he, he would leave to go take 27 meetings and I would start typing and I would write until midnight and send him what I had and go to sleep. And at nine o'clock in the morning, he'd roll back in and we would do it again. And it was a very intensive process, but working that quickly, we were able to remain in complete creative communion. I didn't have to guess at what he wanted. Um, he didn't have to express his changes in a sort of notes document. It was all happening in live conversation. Um, and so working that way, we were able to come out the other end of seven or 10 days with a director approved complete revision of the script from end to end. Uh, and I would be completely exhausted and sleep for two days. Um, it was a very rewarding process. And he was generous with his time. We did that, I think, twice in Montreal and two or three times in Budapest. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so from the beginning, you knew that there was going to be sort of a part one and part two. Like, how did you guys decide, OK, this is where we want to stop? Um, that well, the, that there would be two pieces is something Denis decided from the outset before I came along. And I'm very glad because I simply don't believe it's possible right, yeah. to treat that novel fairly or well in a single film, even if it were three hours long. Mm -hmm. um, where precisely the break should fall was an interesting question that we wrestled with. And we tried it a couple of ways. There's an alluring interval in the novel itself where there's a time lapse of several years. And then you come back to your heroes to find everything having progressed somewhat. So that was very attractive because it's gonna be a couple of years between movies. You can have a couple of years in the story. It would feel very organic. Um, and we tried it and it didn't fail to work exactly. But what it meant essentially to get to that time break is that you would play through the story of the film as it currently runs. And then you'd follow Paul and Jessica into the Fremen Siege and see them start to find their place. Um, there would be mystical transitions as Jessica becomes a reverend mother. And, um, and he sort of comes of age and becomes a leader among the Fremen, which is really the beginning of a story. Um, and so two, that would have done two things. I think it would have sort of felt like a beginning that was broken off abruptly at the end of the movie because we don't follow that strand forward. That's but also when you see it on screen executed with the skill that Denis Villeneuve brings to the project, the tragedy of the Atreides is completely punishing and heartbreaking. And to see Duke Leto walk knowingly into the jaws of a trap, confident that he can somehow find a way through and to then to be betrayed twice over and, and to fail mm -hmm. uh, is shattering, heartbreaking. And I think at the end of the movie, the audience is just suffused with this emotion. And the, the happy ending of Dune part one is that although the tree has burned, a seed has found purchase, mm -hmm. and House Atreides is still alive because Paul and Jessica are out there and because they have found a place. And it's very touch and go at the end about whether they'll find a place, but they just barely get a toehold and avoid being killed casually by the Fremen for their water. Um, and that's the hope. That happy ending is about the tragedy that went before. And so it all rhymes, it all feels of a piece. The house of Atreides has fallen, but the air is still alive and secret and there's still hope. Mm -hmm. If we would carried on into the Fremen story and then it's a story about Muad'Dib resurgent and maybe going to be the Messiah and maybe going to lead the Fremen to war. Well, it's sort of an unrelated story to the story of house Atreides and it felt like different matter. Mm -hmm. So after trying it a few different ways, we ultimately, um, came to the break point you see in the film and getting there involved teasing apart pieces of the story a little bit so that we kept some beats from that transition into the Fremen community that are about Paul coming of age, about him becoming a man. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, we brought the duel to the death with Jamis um, so that he kills someone for the first time in his life against his will and duel of honor. Mm -hmm. um, 
And we could have added a beat of emphasis where we make it very plain that Paul himself is deciding to go into the desert, that he could run now, that there might be some refuge off world and that he could flee into, but he's going to follow his father's path and he's going to follow the Fremen road into the desert. Um, there are other pieces of that that are less about Paul coming of age and more about Paul becoming Muad'Dib, mm -hmm. uh, Paul becoming a Fremen leader that we show forward into the next movie. So we sort of took that transition and parsed it according to what it was about. And everything is about Paul becoming a man lives at the end of movie one. And everything is about Paul becoming a prophet gets shoved into movie two. That's fascinating. Um, I was curious, you mentioned this a little bit before, but how did you decide, you know, with Denis, like what elements you really wanted to lean into, what things, because like you said, there's so much. Um, and so in terms of the world building and the writing, like what was your focus? Did you have any, I mean, maybe based on the previous film or were there, was there anything where you said, okay, maybe this isn't something we should lean into as much? What was your approach? Um, it was all about the book. I was never a fan of the Lynch Dune, although Denis likes it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the bottom line is that even at half the novel, you're looking at more material than you can fit into the film. Mm -hmm. And as is often the case making any movie, we tried to do more than we succeeded in doing, meaning that we tried to fit some stuff in there that ultimately had to go. Mm -hmm. And what we found in practice, it's all very well to talk about this stuff in theory, but you've really got to sit down and try to write the thing and see what works and doesn't work to right. get a sense for why. And what we found in practice is that every place we tried to do the work the book does of explaining the rules of this complex imaginary universe, movie began to settle in the water and to feel a little waterlogged with it. Um, every time we were talking about the lives of the family in the center of the movie, Paul and Jessica and Leto, the movie would dance. And so it just became a game of exposition Jenga to remove as much as possible uh, from each scene of the film, uh, the talking about the lore, the rules, the, the map painting behind us, which is really just the backdrop for our story. Uh, and just saying as little as we could about that, only what was necessary to understand uh, the ordeal the family was entering and going through. Um, and the more we took out, the better the movie sailed along. Mm. And so it was that brutal economy of world building that made the film, I think, succeed uh, and prevented it from getting bogged down in talk because Dune for all that it has some epic action in it as a novel, uh, is one of the talkiest books in science fiction and filled with internal monologue and intimate character conversations, um, which on screen would either have been impossible to execute or would have been soporific. Mm -hmm. Did you worry about, you know, whether the audience was able to come along? And obviously the film was a huge success and, and they did, but was there ever a moment of like, okay, you know, are they going to be able to follow? Are we leaving people behind? What was your sort of thoughts on that? We did worry about it. Um, we had, of course, our intimate readers and, you know, and then in the later game, early screenings, mm -hmm. uh, sort of vet some of those things. Um, but what we realized is it came down to two separate questions. Um, there are a lot of aspects of the world that newcomers to the Dune universe don't really need to understand to follow the story. Um, there were great scenes between our two mentats, Peter de Vries and Thufir Hawat. Uh, and I missed those scenes. There was a lovely chess match between them over the course of the film where you see them strategizing against one another. Mm -hmm. And it's indicated by their affect that they have some kind of cognitive superpower, that these guys are the ones doing the really crunchy supercomputing in their minds. But in fact, with far less than those scenes, I think you do quickly get that Kafir Hawat is the guy with the big brain that you go to for the answers. And does the audience need to know what a mentat of the mentat school is or how their minds work? Not to follow the story. Mm. And so what we 
ended up finding was there's sort of two questions. Um, are we doing enough to signal to the true believers in Dune that we know? We know the shape of the universe. We are abiding by its forms. Um, and we are honoring in substance what a sword master, the Ganaz is, what a Mentat is, what a Bene Gesserit is, what a guild navigator is, and so forth. What the Fal Ferluce, the great houses. Um, so the signposts are scattered throughout the film to make it very plain that we understand and are being faithful to the structure of the universe. So uh, there are little whispers and shouts to Dune fans everywhere in the film. But for those details that are not essential to understanding the story of Paul, Jessica, and Leto, mm -hmm. um, we don't bog newcomers down in little lectures mm -hmm. about how all those features of the universe work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we found, I don't think it was just one right way to make the movie, but I think we found a good way um, and a way that plays. Um, and you mentioned this a little bit, but you are, I don't know if you're working on part two, if you're finished, but um, you know, what was your approach? Was there anything that you kind of, from the earlier parts of the novel that you kind of weave through, like as much as I don't want you to get, I don't want to get you in trouble, but as much as you would like to tell me about that process. Uh, we are still working on part two. Um, I think it's looking very satisfactory. Um, <laughs> there are a couple of big pieces of business that got booted uh, out of chronology mm -hmm. into part two. The and the scene. biggest, say again? Dinner scene. Oh, well, the dinner scene, um, the dinner scene we wrote several variations on um, because I love that scene. That's my, one of my favorites in the book. So we wrote the dinner, it felt static. We reimagined it as cocktails mingling, people on foot, a little more flirting and, and movement in the shot. Um, still really fun, loved it, um, but immensely talky. Mm -hmm. And right at the moment it happens, the Atreides are deeply worried about their standing in Arakeen and afraid that sabotage and espionage may yet take them down. And in the novel, the dinner scene plays because despite everyone's making polite conversation, seated with veiled barbs, we're hearing them thinking and they're thinking in states of paranoia and anxiety about who's playing what game and who's on whose side and who's a friend and who's an enemy and who's probably a spy and where danger lies and, and whether they're maintaining a, a convincing enough front over the course of the event. Without those internal monologues, the cocktails are cocktails and it yeah. feels insufficiently urgent for that point in time in the film. So that's a beat that plays in the novel because you have a pipeline into everyone's mm -hmm. interior. Mm -hmm state but in the film it felt like sitting down it felt like bleeding off the urgency of the story mm -hmm. and we were running long and choices had to be made mm -hmm. and i'm sorry uh, but you were saying that um there were certain things that were moved out of chronological order the biggest piece of business um that we shifted is the introduction of fade rautha harkonnen mm -hmm. who is one of the baddies in the story okay. and in some ways Paul Atreides opposite number. Mm -hmm. um, he is the young nephew of the vulgar Baron Harkonnen. He is around Paul's age and like Paul, highly intelligent, cunning and extraordinary fighter and destined to rule. Um, and just as Paul has hatched the idea at the end of part one, um, that there might even be a way for him to make a play for the imperial throne because the emperor has no sons. And if Paul could develop enough leverage, he might make a play for the hand of the princess. Mm -hmm. um, over on the Harkonnen side, Baron Harkonnen has imperial ambitions for Fade Rautha. Mm -hmm. um, and they are both important figures in the Bene Gesserit breeding scheme as they try to bring around the Kwisatz Haderach, the one. Um, so these two guys are very important figures. And in following the strict chronology, 
By the time you reach the point where Jessica and Paul are going into the desert at the end of part one, in the novel, you've already met Fade Rautha in a, in a grand introduction in a gladiatorial arena, big sequence that uh, all the fans of the book remember. Yeah. And we made the choice to push that into the second movie because the second movie sort of has a kind of natural shape where those two figures as yin and yang protagonist and antagonist play out parallel stories. Um, and so we pushed Fade Routh into the second film um, where he naturally resides in the, in the second half of this big tale. Mm -hmm. um, and to wrap up, you know, you're a science fiction writer. You've published several things, which is fascinating. Um, how does that work with your screenwriting? Do they inform one another? Is there a lesson you took from, you know, writing a book that you brought to the screen? I think the hardest part of both forms of work is staying in the chair. <laughs> um, yeah, it is. And so, yeah, I think the, the lessons that apply across the board from fiction to nonfiction to screenwriting mm -hmm. um, is that doing the thinking in advance, outlining and doing a thorough thought exploration always pays off. Mm -hmm. And and then you got to stick in the chair and you got to grind. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, I so appreciate you giving me so much of your time and like really letting me kind of dig into your brain. Um, as I let you go, is there anything that I didn't ask you about that, that you wanted to mention? Um, Honestly, I think you've asked great questions. I've got thank nothing. You. Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for- Thank you, have a great day. Yeah, you as well. Bye-bye.